Um, so we're just going to take a couple of questions uh, before we move on to our last uh, speaker of the day. If everyone who, um, Alison, Beth, Kalioki, um, if you unmute yourselves and join us again, um, thank you so much for an incredibly insightful um, panel on how to kind of think about sustainability and heritage studies. One of the uh, first things, and I think that Sarah, you sort of just um, touched on it at the end of it, but really, uh, this whole panel seems to basically be full circle of what we were, what was introduced um, at the beginning when I was speaking about social sustainability and the entanglement and uh, interrelationship between a lot of um, these different angles of sustainability. And uh, the question is basically, how do you bring these sort of things to uh, this? How do you show the vast entanglement? Um, and how do you bring it forward to what would be considered a kind of chewable, bite-sized uh, policy nugget or something that basically um, decision makers at policy level who are looking at more, uh, you know, not just evidence, not just opinions, but just a whole range of context. How do you bring these ideas um, to top level? Uh, decision making, and that's a question for everyone, really. If Alice um, can start, since you're first on the list. Yeah, I, well, I'll start straight off by saying I don't have an answer for you, <laughs> but I, I, can, I have some thoughts. Um, I think it's really interesting, actually, and in a sense, you, you kind of, we've, we've all been kind of, I think, roughly hitting the same nails it were and it reminds me a little bit of something that Mike was saying in the previous session about this dichotomy between values and evidence you know? and you Sarah also just said something quite interesting now which about with regards to evidence-based policy because obviously what you're talking about is how, how do you how do you inform policy and ideally we do that through providing evidence but sometimes you're trying to provide evidence for what's obvious, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so then it comes down. To, then it comes down to values, doesn't it? Really. And I think it is about messaging, and I think it is about framing. And I think really, um, I think this is why framing I mean, yeah. in people-centered terms is really crucial because it has to resonate. You know, and politicians, I mean, they're part swayed by evidence and they're a lot swayed by opinion. Yeah. And, and it's, it's values. And so I think it really is about, you know, getting that language right. There was a lovely comment also that Adala was making, and I can't remember if it was in the break or the previous session, <laughs> about, about language and about, you know, having those conversations. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think it's a journey. Um, <laughs> and, 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 I, and, I, and I would also say, I think the, the, the problem also with seeking evidence is that we tend to get very, very complicated and drill down into the endless detail yes. when sometimes you just need something really simple that, that gets across. You can back it up later with evidence, but you need the message. Uh, that Beth also is an attendee and you can't see her. Beth, do you have any? any I uh, think... Um, it's a really good question, thank you. And I think um, I'll probably respond firstly by saying that we need to challenge the ways in which policymakers think, um, what's known as their civic epistemologies, um, and actually challenge this idea that all that's useful is chewable nuggets in the first place. Um, and I think we've had some success in engaging decision makers in the research itself in co-producing the critique so that that complexity becomes more relevant and understandable to them in their own terms. So I think there is a bit of an issue there in the first place that all we're supposed to do is provide these nuggets. Um, and in my own sort of discipline, the phrase evidence based policy or is what we need rather than policy based evidence seems quite um, relevant. I think the second thing, just to echo what Alison said, is around um, really granular examples and case studies that can actually show this complexity. Um, we did a piece of work. Um, again, with my colleagues in Kasumu in Cape Town with Mr. Urban Futures um, and the JPI Cultural Heritage Programme, looking at festivals as sites for these kinds of entanglements that kind of show the different values and diversity of tangible and intangible cultural, cultural heritage values. Um, and sometimes complexity can only be seen through that example. 
um, or through specific examples. So I think that's really important. Calliope? Yes, uh, basically I will just reiterate what Alice and, and uh, Beth said. Uh, sorry for the voices of the background, these are my daughters. <laughs> they just uh, came in too. Um, so what we actually we, we will be doing, and this is something that also my colleagues have been doing for many years, but not in the context of heritage, we will do that in the context of heritage this time, is that all this complex, these diagrams that I just showed you, we're going to co-create them. So basically, this is a tool for the policymakers and other stakeholders to think. So we'll be co-creating through discussions and conversations uh, what is the situation we will be much mapping together on, on a piece of paper, not on the software, uh, with different colors. And as we do that, we'll be discussing uh, what is the situation uh, currently in, uh, in the case studies and what, is the, what are their fears for the future or the vision for the future. And we will be doing that through the, what we call participatory um, workshops, system dynamic workshops with uh, different stakeholders. And um, uh, the so far experience shows that by working together with the policy makers, rather than just collecting evidence in many different ways and providing that evidence, is actually a much more effective way. And also it helps the policy makers to really understand some of the issues that we can't communicate otherwise. And Sarah? Um, I guess I was going to say, and sorry, I wasn't sure how it worked. I'm sorry, Alison, if I was cutting over you, I was, I was kind of trying to agree with you and extend. So if I, if I start there, and apologies. Um, I guess there's a point about values, but there's also a point about value um, and that kind of narrowness of economic value that is cutting out of everything. And I think there's a kind of overall what policymakers need is a move to more of a donut economy style of thinking about the space in which the economy occurs so that the space in which the economy is allowed to play is one that is built on a strong human foundation where we have got well-being and within an environmental context where we're not heading for a kind of Armageddon scenario. And I think that that isn't necessarily a, a values led so you could have a you could be a conservative and have a donut economy and you could also be um, a, a very highly socialist and have an approach to the donor economy. And so I feel like there's this kind of little, we've allowed ourselves this weird tension where we behave as if the sort of it's some people with one set of values think that it's right not to destroy the environment or some people with one set of values think it's right um, not to have slavery. And actually, I think there are certain things that we need to reveal as being falsehoods and accept not as values, but as facts of how we would like to live. And I know, I understand that that is also then a set of values. Um, but I do feel there's a, there's a sort of a frustration um, around the economic value. And I guess who makes policy is people who are in charge of public bodies and public bodies are constrained in a, another economic framework around delivering best value for public money. And so there's this thing about even in those best value considerations and even with a social value act that says you are allowed to do maths that includes people, they very often don't and there's a tendency towards just doing the cheapest thing or the, the, the thing that maximises income and then that therefore drives everything towards one value proposition that ex is very, very tends, has a tendency to exclude people who are already excluded and has a tendency to exclude anything that is um, rich in ways that are beyond turnover, I guess, if I can choose my words reasonably carefully. Um, so I, it, it's very, very exciting hearing some of the way that you are in the research discipline framing some of these questions to try to challenge some of that power. Um, but I want to thank you as panelists. Thank you so much for, um, for, for talking us through your project. And, uh, and we hope to keep the conversation going afterwards as well.